January 1966, 10 artists from New York and 30 engineers from Bell Telephone Laboratories began a collaboration that resulted in a series of dance, music, and theater works. They all incorporated the new technology. Nine evenings of theater and engineering took place in October 1966 at the 69th Regiment Armory in New York. The performances were recorded and filmed both in color and in black and white. While this material can of course not represent the artist's work in full, it has now been assembled by Barbara Schultz into 10 films that document each artist's work. Nine evenings came about through the generosity of the artists, the engineers, and our many friends. But above all, it was Robert Rauschenberg's commitment to the collaboration that provided the spirit and the energy that made it all happen.
Solomon. I am Dave Sagarin. I am Aviva Stone. I'm Lars Lorisch. I am Yassi Baskin. Hey, my name is Norby Bullock. I'm Eliza Tan. I am Cosmos Robert Savage. I am Lou Hall. I am Walter Siegel. I am Charles Hall. I am Barbara Walt. I am Gail Wright. I am Jen Preston. I am Alice Preston. I am Christina Wheeler. I am Dan Sacha. Oh, I am Carol Perlase. I am Grace Panico. Bob Solomon. I am Dave Sagarin. I am Aviva Stone. I'm Lars Lorosh. I am Yassi Baskin.
I was working at Bell Telephone Laboratories at the time. But I was, of course, also aware of the tremendous explosion in the New York art world. When the idea of Nine Evenings came about, I organized meetings between artists and engineers. It was Larry Hylos, Harold Hodges, and Jim McKee who built and tested the electronic equipment for open score and who collaborated with Robert Rauschenberg. The tiny transmitter in the handles of the tennis rackets in open score were built by Bill Kaminsky. Nine Evenings was truly the first one-to-one -one collaboration between artists and engineers. An area of intellect that, that, that was so isolated uh, colliding with uh, with something that that had no direction, you know, which is what I think art should. That's the way it should be going. <laughs> <laughs> Both of them shared their infinite possibilities and impossibilities. But it really opened up the mind and the spirit. I think the engineers like the spirit, and I think the artists like the mind. <laughs> <laughs> and the guys were working for nothing. We were working for nothing. What a way to run a business, huh? <laughs> 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 it was very interesting. Um, I think uh, when you get on the technical side of things, you tend to look at things in just a certain way because of the technical limitations of it. And here is this whole bunch of people that came along and wanted to do something else with the technology. And it was a fun time, is what it really was. And the artists seemed to be enjoying themselves when they were working through it. So I'd, I'd classify the whole thing as a very fun experience. For some of us, like me, it was like opening up a window to a whole new world. And once we saw this, we didn't want to let it go. I missed the intellectual challenge of trying to make the artist's vision come through. Gee, I, I got a, a, a deeper appreciation for the artist, per se. Uh, I began to realize that, hey, while they were doing things that were different, they were really just people like the rest of us, with some tremendous imagination and with uh, some forethought as to what, what they could work with, what was available to them. Uh, very stimulating. We had become interested in the process that we were involved in, which was the meeting, marrying and mating, of artists and scientists in a, a kind of coupling that was to produce some form of hopefully synergistic um, new wrinkle in, in um, artistic thought and scientific thought. Hopefully that they would repel each other and attract each other in some strange dance and we would get out of that the flowering, the explosion, the evolution of something for the future. The importance of Nine Evenings of Art and Technology has been largely overlooked because <laughs> so many things took place after it. Because it is literally the first time that artists formally used technology and, and electronics in their work. It was the seed from which I took and became, one of, uh, along with the many other people, which now number the millions of people using technology in their art, with other people. But Bob originated the idea. It, was, it arose in his heart and Billy's and everyone else. With the engineering, the piece has a kind of an elegance 
which is consistent with the nature of the piece. And as far as I'm concerned, this has got to be one of the most uh, sharp and focused, coherent and solid of Bob's uh, performance pieces or theater pieces. Uh, I think it is, and, and which makes it, of course, one of the most uh, wonderful performance pieces of all time, anywhere, by anybody. The structure of the piece, I think, is also kind of interesting because it's also very unusual in the sense that it's almost classic. You have a, almost a beginning and a middle and an end in a regular conventional sense. It's almost like straight out of the 18th century. You can almost imagine somebody like that being uh, reborn now and understanding what this piece was like. So you start out with the tennis game. Frank, Frank Stella and Mimi Karnick uh, came up dressed in uh, their usual tennis uh, outfits. But the racket that they used had been wired, as they say nowadays. The uh, rackets have the uh, handle drilled out so they can, they can uh, hide the transmitter uh, which fits, fits into here and a battery and the uh, output of the transmitter which is FM uh, were tuned to the high end of the FM band above the other stations. The light colored wire wrapped around the racket served as the antenna for the transmitter here. Around the stage uh, were several FM receivers, uh, uh, pretty standard type uh, radios, FM radios, that were picking it up and it's being amplified so that it made a very loud noise when each uh, hit was made. We had one kilowatt lights surrounding the armory, lighting up the tennis court and the electrical impulse of the bomb were supposed to switch off the light. Of course, in the last moment, we couldn't make this work. Impossible. Five minutes before Bob's performance was going to start, when the decision was, OK, the show must go on. We'll do it by hand. 